Some of the hardest problems in the world exist far above the planet. Our job, to launch the smartest solutions, to protect our satellites, clean up our clutter, to propel breakthroughs in propulsion, to learn more about our place in the universe, to outpace emerging threats. Every day, the Aerospace Corporation uses the latest technologies to ensure our nation's safety and leadership in space. Welcome to the Space Policy Show, Episode 2, Building Consensus and Trust Across the Space Sector with our guest, Karen Jones. We're so glad you could join us again today. Um, just a reminder, we're here every Tuesday and Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. For more information, you can visit aerospace.org slash policy. We also have a link up there to our past episodes if you missed Tuesday's broadcast. Uh, just a couple housekeeping things here. Uh, we would like for you to join the chat so you can participate, ask questions, things like that. So click the chat box, type in your name, click join, and then you should be in there. And if you have any questions or you have any troubleshooting, I will be helping people along with my co-producer, Colleen, uh, to answer questions and help you if we run into any snags today. Um, so I'm really glad you're all here. Again, we're gonna answer some questions at the end. So please feel free to participate. Um, and Karen, over to you. I'd like uh, Karen Jones, give herself a brief introduction and we'll get right into it. Okay, uh, thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Uh, well, hello everyone. I'm Karen Jones with the Center for Space Policy and Strategy and welcome to my dining room where I'm sure many of us are working these days. Um, recently, uh, CSPS published a paper, Blockchain in the Space Sector, and it's part of our Game Changer series where the Center looks at various emerging technologies, and these could be technologies coming out of other industries, and we examine how they may disrupt or change the status quo in the space sector. We're not looking for incremental improvements, but game-changing differences. Uh, so our recent paper is now on our website, but uh, let's look at our Game Changer uh, paper series. Uh, and uh, with that, um, I'd like to kind of launch right into uh, blockchain and what it means to the space sector. Um, the the purpose of the paper and this webinar is to demystify blockchain and provide an overview of the technology and to get a pulse on how the technology could become more relevant in the space sector. Uh, I might add that at the beginning of the Game Changer uh, paper, uh, we, we had a considerable amount, understandably, of skepticism about blockchain technologies. However, as I describe this technology, there's a few fundamental things that might spark an interest for you. Uh, so please ask uh, uh, questions or send me emails after this uh, webinar if you have any other questions. Um, chances are you've heard of Bitcoin, the digital currency that promised to revolutionize currency and payments. And indeed, it, it is a revolutionary technology. Um, blockchain is the platform or the technology that underpins Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. And while these uh, cryptocurrencies might seem revolutionary, the real revolution is digital ledger technology, also known as DLT, which underlies this entire thing. And I'm going to, unfortunately, and I know it's a little confusing, possibly use these terms somewhat interchangeably, DLT, is a more uh, general term for blockchain. Um, uh, two years ago, the Department of Commerce uh, basically encouraged all industries to examine this technology and look for missed opportunities and undesirable surprises. We should start investigating whether or not blockchain can help. So thus, Aerospace decided to study this, and we're act we actually have a few studies underway one is looking at how blockchain or DLT might address um, space traffic management. Again, the purpose of this uh, presentation is to provide an overview. We're going to look at other industries. We think other industries are leading uh, DLT efforts. And in this area, 
space will be a follower. We are not an early adopter. And that actually is a kind of a comfortable position uh, for us. We can watch the uh, failures and successes of the other industries. Um, we're also gonna highlight a few use case scenarios. Uh, next slide, please. So the, tre the lexicon is very treacherous and, and this really is because of how uh, blockchain evolved. Uh, in 2008, an anonymous mysterious person by the name of Natashi Nakamoto uh, released a white paper describing the software protocol uh, behind um, for Bitcoin. The title of the white paper was Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And it proposed a system uh, for electronic uh, transactions uh, without relying on trust. Instead, it proposed a framework of coins made from digital signatures and a peer-to-peer -peer network using proof of work to record a public history of transactions. Uh, this was a seminal white paper and the Bitcoin revolution was born. We still do not know the identity of this mysterious person, Satoshi Nakamoto. Perhaps it's a, a group of people. Um, however, because it started, you know, it just came onto the scene like that. Uh, terminology is muddled and uh, it's evolving. Uh, there are now groups uh, in place to kind of create a little more discipline about around it. I will also say that there's a lot of uh, consulting organizations who have uh, taken up the charge of creating more of a discipline around this, such as IBM Blockchain Solutions, uh, Deloitte and others are looking at how to better, you know, create kind of a uniform structure around this. Um, uh, some of the terms are rather crazy, for instance, airdrop. Uh, means marketing campaign. A bounty is a simple program run to reward those who can find bugs in the uh, uh, blockchain software. A FUD is fear and uncertainty and doubt. It's a strategy essentially for market manipulation of Bitcoin. Um, another term here is whale. It's investors who uncommonly um, accumulate large quantities of Bitcoins or cryptocurrencies. Uh, thus manipulating the market. Um, this jargon to me uh, is also indicative of Bitcoin is somewhat hyped and there is a lot of market uh, manipulation, but that's not the lessons and the applications that the space sector will adopt. And we're going to look more broadly than that. Um, next slide, please. So blockchain is not always an appropriate solution. It depends upon the application scenario. Um, when does blockchain make sense? Um, first of all, trust. When you have two mutually uh, mistrusting parties that want to interact, this is a good way to do it. There's some transparency, there's an immutable ledger. Also, um, when you have um, a change of state for a system and you want to track those new transactions through some kind of uh, database, again, this might be a way to do it through distributed ledger. Also, you want to disintermediate potentially some kind of existing, perhaps traditional centralized third party um, to maybe harness greater efficiencies or maybe to take bias out of the system itself. This is, this is going to be very interesting within the space sector as uh, we think about our centralized, trusted parties that help us with various transactions. Just keep that parked in your head and we'll be talking about that in a minute. So when does blockchain not make sense? First of all, when there's no stored data in a database, um, when it's not that important maybe to track these um, state changes, or perhaps when the uh, current system has trusted entities that currently interact pretty well and rather efficiently. So these key questions must be answered. DLT, distributed ledger technology, is not always appropriate. Um, so um, also, um, also, blockchain uh, might be constrained by certain operational parameters, such as latency, access, 
and capacity. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Uh, next slide, please. So some key questions. Um, these are really good as you're examining or as any enterprise is examining their business systems. Should I consider DLT as a suitable option for a business or regulatory application? And can this potentially replace a current trusted central authority? If the answer is no, if there's no real incentive, then blockchain may not work. But if the answer is yes, there could be opportunities to um, accrue lower transaction costs, greater security, uh, or operational efficiency. Um, if the answer is yes there, there are key decisions related to the operations and performance for a potential space sector application. So um, DLT is often um, considered when you want to think about how best to reach consensus efficiently and when you don't really trust your partners. Um, uh, so moving on to the next slide, we'll get into what are some of the, uh, uh, well, what are the key processes? So I don't know if you can read this clearly, but it starts always with a person who wants to um, basically um, send a digital asset and that digital asset or token or coin um, could represent a security it could represent IP rights or digital rights. It could represent a uh, property, a title. Um, it could represent a transaction. So that private key locks it down and encrypts it. It's sent over a peer-to-peer -peer network with these various nodes uh, working on this. And it could be millions. It could just be a few. So it's broadcast to this P2P network. On the other side, there is validation and de-encryption. And this is where there is a fork in the road between, I wanna to try to distinguish here between blockchain and DLT. They're really just two different types of consensus. Um, uh, blockchain involves proof of work, sometimes like in the case of Bitcoin, millions of miners out there that try to solve a puzzle um, or mine a block in order to add uh, the block to the chain. It is very energy intensive. And, um, you know, basically, when um, uh, the uh, anonymous person Nakamoto came up with this, the idea was um, to allow one CPU, one vote, as opposed to having an IP with one vote, because an IP address is easy to replicate and, and uh, create false ID addresses as well. So this was one way of doing it. And it, it serves the problem by um, um, making... Um, by determining representation in majority decision making. It's one way of um, basically conducting consensus, but there are many, many other methodologies. And so DLT is the larger, broader term uh, for this type of consensus. But ultimately the transaction is complete after de-encryption and validation. And um, the ledger is available to those that have permissions to view it. Um, so that's typically the, um, the process. And um, with the next slide, um, we can look at what are the key elements. So distributed ledger technology has um, a few key elements. The first one is that every node on the network maintains its own copy. Uh, this provides some resilience. Um, and um, it updates their information with each new transaction. Um, the transmission is also resilient in terms of being peer-to-peer. -peer. There's no central point of storage. Uh, information is being recorded and interchanged between parties or nodes. Um, and um, trust can be verified by the entire community. Now, some of these nodes might be bad nodes. They could be bad actors. But you really have to have a majority of bad actors within the system for blockchain to break down. So again, if you have enough good actors, the system works. And that's how it is designed. Uh, also, the records are locked down. They are what uh, blockchainers call immutable. Any one person is prevented from altering the legitimacy of these records. 
There's also the ability, and this was where we'll talk about smart contracts, to embed logic and create some degree of automation. And this will allow for future efficiency gains as well. So um, let's see. Um, moving on to the next slide. And this is one where we talk about open and closed DLT systems. And for me, this was my aha moment for how we can use DLT, distributed ledger technologies, in the space world. Because when you think of this um, DLT uh, technology, you can be completely open, like Bitcoin, or somewhat closed. So I believe a lot of the applications we're going to see in the space industry will be on the closed side. And it looks very, very different from the cryptocurrencies that many of us are familiar with. So the first thing you want to do is ask what data should be collected and with whom should it be shared? Who participates and who maintains the ledger? Those are the key questions to design what type of DLT you want. Um, so for an open participation, open ledger like Bitcoin, the ledger is freely shared, it's open, and anyone can play, anyone can trade Bitcoin. The safety is in terms of numbers. As long as you have more good nodes or good actors than bad actors, it works. There's also something called permissioned ledger where anyone can play and participate but the ledger is controlled by a smaller group. Uh, this might be something like identity management, such as the uh, sovereign has a, a way to conduct identity management. So they maintain the ledger, but anyone can have an ID and they maintain your ID. Uh, this is becoming very popular with ID management and a few other types of applications. Now, closed participation and a permission ledger is something where I see um, a lot of applications for any enterprise. For instance, it could be within aerospace, it could be perhaps within Satellite Industry Association and all its members. The owner group maintains the ledger and they pretty much know who's participating as well. It could be a consortium, an industry group, um, or a private enterprise. Um, banks are now using this to conduct business between a group of banks for various transactions. Um, a lot of money's at stake and it seems to be a trusted way to do things. Um, I think this is where we're going to see some applications within the space industry. We're rather small compared to other industries and typically we don't interact that much directly with the general public. Um, so this was my aha moment looking at uh, uh, DLT and how it applies. Um, the next slide, please. So the next thing is to think about the value chain of space, concept design, acquisition, manufacture and build, operate, and the end users. Um, what are those key application areas where DLT could apply? Uh, we've examined a few, certainly not everything, and I might add that if we leave something, uh, if there is an omission, it's not based upon any intentional omission. These are just a few examples here. And we're also not endorsing some of the examples we're giving either. Um, however, um, we wanted to provide a kind of a broad array. And one of the things I wanna point out is there's enterprise or business applications and also regulatory functions as well. Um, I don't know which one's going to gain traction first. Um, but I'll go ahead and start with um, number one, fundraising. But as you can see, you can go from beginning to end, concept design to end users, and there's a vast array of applications in between. So moving to the first one, which is fundraising, and this is probably closest. Next slide, please, sorry. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. I think this is, actually I can start with this one, I'm sorry, this works. So this is um, the um, value chain um, and the life cycle maturity for these various applications. Uh, off to the right, you have the various industries and their state of maturity. You've probably heard the word FinTech or 
financial technology. It's very mature at this point. Um, there's many uh, players in this market uh, using cryptocurrencies and different types of fintech uh, with DLT, uh, the underlying technology uh, enabling it. Um, so off to the left, you see where the space sector is. There are a few demo projects uh, for financing new ventures that are underway. We'll talk about a few. Smart contracts, again, I mentioned embedded logic. It's in a market growth phase with many um, players coming onto the scene. Again, the space sector is in demo phase. And the same with networking and comm. We're starting to see some advancements, particularly as NASA has started to issue some grants in this area. ID management is something every industry needs. Uh, other industries seem to be taking the lead on that. Uh, this is affording the space industry the ability to be um, kind of a fast follower. We can watch the failures and successes of these different industries and pick and choose which one might be applicable. There's also IP rights and digital rights. It's really in its very early phases right now. Um, we're also looking at traffic management. Uh, I think we're going to see some interesting work coming out of autonomous vehicle market as uh, we think about how traffic is managed. Well, how are these autonomous vehicles on the road going to be managed? We can um, examine some of the things coming out of the car industry and the automobile safety industry and think about how does this apply to maybe space traffic management. There will be various Karen, growth. Yeah. Oh, hi. Sorry, Karen. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, so you might be getting to this. So if I'm a little early, you have to excuse that. What important space sector application do you believe will gain traction within the next five years? Okay, that's a good question. I think initially I would have said supply chain management. It's one we're all concerned about, especially now with the pandemic underway and all the different uh, supply chain uh, disruptions we've seen. However, supply chain management requires a lot of enterprise coordination and interoperability to occur. It, it just takes an extremely large amount of time to go for, um, to basically implement this type of large scale um, project. Uh, it requires coordination across a vast ecosystem of vendors. So I'm not gonna say supply chain. I think near term, we need to examine where there might be some small scale projects with a limited number of participants um, that um, have relatively simple use cases um, and that are capable of launching in just a few months. And by the way, that was Bitcoin. Um, they um, actually, they had a lot of participants, but it was open ledger, open participation. Um, but something that's rather simple and it doesn't take a degree of disintermediation, for instance, of a trusted party. Uh, there, you can just kind of move forward uh, uh, quickly, small scale, and then grow it. Uh, I think with government uh, endorsement and maybe some grants, government might be thinking about ways to disintermediate some of their sluggish processes. For instance, um, the Space Policy Directive 2, um, um, it calls for streamlining uh, space regulations and um, uh, for the commercial use of outer space. So that could give us the incentive to examine regulatory processes in the space sector, such as maybe uh, commercial imagery uh, licensing, perhaps launch certification, um, uh, and other types of licensing, maybe even spectrum licensing. It's going to start small with demos and then grow. Perhaps we'll see something happen within the next five years if we get enough incentive and commitment from government. Karen, Ben said perhaps like requirements management question mark. So I don't know if that's something you uh, want to touch on if you already mentioned it. Um, I think requirements management could be one. There might be other ways to do that because uh, requirements management um, already has some enterprise tools that work pretty effectively although they're not interoperable. You know, there's several out there. I, I, I'm trying to go back to the days when I did this, like Rational Rose and a few other of these tools. So remember, we have to get back to those questions. Does it work now? And is it trusted now? And um, how much efficiency would you gain from doing that? Uh, so possibly 
um, I would have to sit down and look at that closely. And I might add that there's a lot of good consulting firms out there. Uh, and I think aerospace can also do this as well, which is examine what's in it for the stakeholders. And is there enough of a win? Great, thank you, Karen. I have a, another question about the game changer life cycle. The Gartner Group maps life cycle occurs for various technologies. Apparently blockchain has moved into a life cycle phase called the trowel of disillusionment. Why do you think that is? Yeah, well, the trough of disillusionment is definitely where blockchain is now, and that's a good thing. I think good things come out of the uh, trough of disillusionment, and then you move on to the plane of enlightenment, as uh, Gartner calls it. So I think we're there. In fact, um, Gartner, I have some notes here on what Gartner said about this life cycle uh, formulation. They believe that um, blockchain will start to climb out of the trough of disillusionment um, uh, soon, maybe by next year, but um, uh, they noted that they will not see an enabling digital business revolution across many business ecosystems until maybe at least 2028. Um, that's when they see blockchain become fully scalable, technically and operationally. What they mean there is that right now it's kind of, I think, fragmented. Uh, it's, in, it's not interoperable enough. Again, getting back to the supply chain example, if I implement supply chain as a space manufacturer, uh, well, what is the system that my ecosystem of vendors and parts and suppliers are also using? We all, at this point, need to you know, work very hard to get onto the same platform. Uh, but with enough standards in place addressing interoperability, then this could take off. And that will take time. That's why Gartner thinks it's going to be a, a slow growth. So um, there are some um, DLT consulting firms working effectively and uh, 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 with the various customers to minimize uh, the jargon and get beyond the uh, crypto slang to talk about what is it that this industry needs and how can it be interoperable? We will get there, but it's looking like it's going to be slow. Thank you, Karen. Okay, um, let's see. Um, well, let's move on to the, the next slide. Um, this is just a list of some of the applications that we're going to go over. And I might add that the paper, Blockchain and Space Sector, uh, has the life cycle curve as well as all these um, examples in the paper itself. Uh, so we're going to start with financing new ventures and work our way through ID management. Um, next slide, please. So um, it seems like for financing new ventures, it didn't seem that long ago that um, we were looking at uh, fundraising sites uh, like Indigo and others as being disruptors. Well, now uh, blockchain and DLT seem to be disrupting the disruptor with a new way to finance new ventures. Uh, using these cryptocurrency tokens, they can, they're also called security token offerings, or STOs. Um, these are now definitely competing with crowdsourcing sites. Um, in fact, um, over the past um, year, there's been over, I'm trying to remember the number here, I have my notes here on this, I think over um, 34 billion was raised in internet-based uh, crowdfunding startups. And um, they typically charge transaction fees. DLT could be a good way to create more efficiency and get around some of these transaction fees, which can be, you know, maybe 5%. So Ethereum, which is um, which also has a cryptocurrency, uh, established Acorn, and it um, created an open community and marketplace for crowdfunding. There's others out there. Now, from a space perspective, we have an example. It's very much in its early demo phase. And in fact, it's probably not much past white paper or concept phase now, a company called Space Decentral. And um, they're using blockchain to reinvigorate the push for exploration um, into outer space. They're designing space missions collaboratively to share research for peer review. 
Uh, someone asked earlier about uh, requirements, and perhaps this is the type of thing that should be looked at because um, as they think about future space missions and using essentially this crowdsourcing way to pull in um, crowd interest, this might also be a way to gather requirements. Uh, so there are crowdfunding projects that lack that um, that lack national budgets. This could be something that could address citizen space and uh, greater civic engagement overall. Um, so um, moving on, another one, uh, next slide please, is smart contracts. Again, we spoke about embedded logic. So um, smart contracts are a type of self-executing uh, contract with the underlying enabling technology being distributed ledger technology. It relies on this uh, embedded logic to trigger certain events. The European Space Agency is working on something called Space 4.0. And really, a lot of their focus has been looking at some rather administrative processes um, within governments for managing the space sector. Um, but they are um, using self-executing contracts to manage various things such as payments, procurement, supplier agreements, and automated smart contracts. Um, they think that um, ESA is basically following what the World Economic Forum calls Industry 4.0. This is Space 4.0. It's digitized and the business itself is digitized and automated. Um, next slide, please. Hi, Karen. I had a quick question from the audience. Steve asked if you could talk about other proof approaches, e.g. proof of stake instead of proof of work. Okay. Proof of stake is a type of consensus where um, instead of, you know, having a node do this um, elaborate kind of uh, problem solving, proof of stake could be uh, for instance, within um, a community, if I have the majority of tokens, then I get the vote, then I can kind of move forward because of proof of stake. And I basically uh, provide consensus that way. So it's a way of showing you have um, essentially um, um, a stake in the game um, or a hand in the game and it, it, it allows uh, it's essentially basically saying that because I have a large stake in whatever the asset group is, I'm trusted. And um, uh, so I would have a lot to lose as well should this backfire on me. So that's what proof of stake is. Um, proof of work is very energy intensive. It requires you know thousands of nodes or computers to solve these complex problems. And it's been criticized as, first of all, not being quick and um, you know being energy intensive. And if you don't have an open system for participants, there's, there's not as much of a reason to use proof of work. Uh, more and more blockchain implementations are getting away from that. Even though Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, that was that was a key pillar of his original uh, white paper. A lot of the recent impl implementations are moving beyond this proof of work concept. And proof of stake is just one of many. And these consensus algorithms, there's, there's a whole range of them and I don't understand all of them, uh, but uh, you can pick and choose. And uh, again, it becomes less important if you know your participants within this uh, circle of uh, uh, that's participating in the DLT. Thanks, Karen. We had another question, um, which if you want to address it later, you can. It's Diana. She asked, um, how will we guarantee security? Cybercrime is a growing challenge. Well, um, with the blockchain, you know, I think this is where a lot of hype comes in because I don't think you really can say it's 100% lockdown. It is one way to um, uh, make things more secure, but there is something called the Byzantine generals uh, uh, problem. And if you have, 
you know, 1 million nodes and 500,000 or more turn out to be bad actors or bad nodes. There goes your, you know, implementation. It's gone bad. And, and maybe there's a way, and I'll talk about some ways that can happen. In fact, with um, smart contracts, it can happen. Um, you know, basically, uh, these implementations for um, DLT, blockchain, they rely, there's a lot of data coming in outside the, uh, the digital world of DLT. And that's where you can um, target an attack and, um, and, and these oracles for, you know, maybe analog observations coming in or whatever is coming into the system as information. That's where you can uh, provide some kind of attack and uh, possibly change uh, and um, uh, imperil the system, so to speak. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's certainly possible. Um, Great, thank you, Karen. Okay, um, let's see. Um, so moving on, okay, supply chain management. This is about creating a forensic audit trail and a single source of truth. This is going to be hard to do as an enterprise without uh, interoperability, but this is uh, very, very important right now uh, for detecting uh, malware, cyber threats, understanding your whole supply chain, where are the counterfeit parts, um, how do you respond, for instance, to product recalls in a timely manner? Having a, a distributed ledger uh, system where you have the uh, immutable records allows you to go back and, and find these things. Um, the DOD is uh, now uh, requiring organizations to, identif uh, to identify critical information and communicate communications technology components and how are these components purchased uh, from trusted suppliers. This is critical. We have to know where these malicious threats are coming from. So certainly um, <clears throat> this is a good implementation to consider. Uh, but again, enterprise-wide, lots of coordination is needed. It would be a long journey. I think it's um, something that could happen. It may take um, on the part of government some kind of leadership um, to ensure that this can happen. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, IP management. Um, this is for copyrights, design, data management, uh, you know, your songs on the, the, uh, that you download. DLT can be used as a registry for IP rights. Um, it can be used to support inventors and creators instead of the long arduous patent process. Um, using this decentralized registry can be very efficient and there's a digital trail for innovation. So you can kind of see which patents depend upon uh, which patents and so on. It, it, it can really uh, replace uh, the tedious process that exists, that exists now for um, idea protection and patents. There's a long way to go with this, but uh, over time, um, something could happen here and um, you know, disrupt the, the current process. It is going to require uh, government buy-in to make this work. Interestingly, uh, Iran has uh, produced some interesting demos for IP protection in this area. For space applications, uh, think about um, how the commercial world struggles with ensuring that um, their value-added derivative uh, data projects are, per are purchased in a way that's recognized. So space imaging data rights, analytics and software and other digital rights. I think the commercial sector um, is going to start to look at this and think about ways to protect their imagery and uh, space data. Uh, next slide. Uh, so NASA is looking at how to look at um, networking in space and deep space and how can they use uh, DLT, um, and specifically when you think about deep space, they don't have the luxury of uh, bringing things back down to earth to vet, you know, uh, should this node talk to that node. Um, so NASA has this project called um, Sensor Web, and they're looking at how do you use uh, smart contracts um, with embedded logic to authorize that this node can speak to this node. Um, there are uh, a few grants that are underway now and um, that is progressing. Um, 
There's also an open source networking standard for ground to space comm called Ethernet uh, that might be useful, especially as the space industry is moving to um, uh, ground station as a service, uh, which is interesting because the world is coming more virtual and more abstract, and it's hard to know uh, how your data is getting from point A to point A, B. And this might be a way to, to manage that and to avoid certain types of networks as well. Uh, next slide. I've already mentioned ID management. This is going to affect every industry where you have a building where you're trying to uh, maintain restricted access. Um, it could be uh, IDs to get onto a network as well. Um, or to access uh, certain subscriptions or imagery. Um, there is self-sovereign identity where the um, identity is controlled by me, um, by the owner. I'm sorry, that's decentralized by uh, the, the vendor. Uh, the sovereign network, sovereign is the name of a company, but there's others out there. They use open source decentralized identity networks. Um, another one is a decentralized trusted identity where um, they use your uh, uh, driver's license, uh, maybe your aerospace ID or whatever, and um, they have a proprietary service that then um, performs identity proofing on this. So both of these are, are being looked at, but at this point, uh, something is needed here across many industries as we continue to see um, uh, that our records and our um, emails and our electronic uh, communications are being hacked and compromised. Uh, during the first half of 2019, we saw a 52% increase in security in incidents versus 2018. So this is uh, this should be a high priority for every industry. Um, next slide. Okay, so um, moving on. Um, Strengths and weaknesses. Blockchain um, can really touch any aspect of the space sector, whether it's um, uh, venture financing through uh, user rights at the end of the value chain. Um, however, we really think that the space sector is going to be a follower. We're going to adopt and we're going to probably observe these leading industries like fintech, um, uh, the pharmaceutical industry with their supply chain uh, demonstrations. Even um, the intermodal container industry um, is using supply chain, I'm sorry, uh, um, digital ledger technology to manage uh, supply chain from cradle to grave. These are all um, industry examples that we should watch closely. Um, I spoke with um, IBM uh, Global Blockchain Services, and they thought that um, the space sector could examine some of these um, manifestations that are successful and, and leverage them. These are things that are already built, and they could be adapted to meet some of our needs. And in that sense, we might actually find that some of our implementations could be um, less expensive, and uh, again, we'll be writing on the, uh, the uh, success stories and the lessons learned of some of these other industries. Um, so we will continue to explore these promising applications over time. Karen, I have a quick question for you. The space sector is typically a leader with new technologies. What do you think is holding it back compared to other industries? Again, I think it's, um, I just think the blockchain is a very, very long journey, you know, to, to implement this. And um, enterprise blockchain projects um, involve the transformation of core market infrastructure. Um, it's a foundational technology and it requires um, transformation across all partners, across industries in the space sector and other industries like uh, our regulators as well. Um, it's been compared to TCPIP, which took 30 years to, to truly uh, gain global traction broadly across every industry sector. And according to a Harvard Business uh, Review article, which I cite in the Game Changer paper, uh, this uh, author, she thinks it's going to take um, just as long to really see this kind of broad and deep application. 
And at the same time, she still views blockchain as a fundamental game changer. So I think it's, um, um, it's just simply going to take time. We're going to be a follower. Uh, the leaders will be the gaming industry for one, financial, healthcare, legal, certainly the music industry with digital rights. Uh, real estate may follow um, and the space sector may follow after that. Uh, I think one thing we can do to hasten adoption is to start to engage with the government sector um, and see where regulators uh, think we have some important um, applications or we should talk to them about uh, committing funds to doing some demonstrations uh, to see what works and, um, and to see if it's better than our current centralized trusted systems in place. Ultimately, it's not going to address all our processes, uh, it's a matter of finding out which ones are best and which ones are most optimal. Uh, so, yeah. so it requires a paradigm shift. Um, we're introducing new forms of governance, uh, rule governing economic orders rather than institutional centric orders. Um, we're going to be competing with firms, market, and economies as institutional alternatives for coordinating economic actions of groups of people. Um, it's going to require cooperation. Um, and um, I think that the close, I'm getting back to uh, an earlier slide. I think as we think about the best applications, I think we're going to think of them in terms of uh, uh, permissioned ledgers, with closed participations. That's the easiest way to at least launch these applications in the near future. Um, so start there, launch some demos, uh, move to enterprise-wide models um, after we see some successes. Uh, and, um, and it's just going to require patience. Great. Thanks, Karen. Uh, we are ready for your questions. Please send them to me on the chat. I am ready. I have my trusty laptop in my lap and we will address them as they come in. Thank you so much, Karen. I thought that was really enlightening. I feel like I learned a lot about blockchain. Um, we'll just give it a second. Sometimes it takes a, a second or two for people to uh, send their questions in. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the paper you just released, Continuous Production Agility. I think that um, that would be great if you wanted to share that. Sure. Well, continuous production and agility is about you know innovation uh, at the speed of relevance, and um, I think now more than ever, CPA is important uh, because we've seen the results of this large worldwide interruption in our lives with the pandemic and the um, impact on the global supply chain. Um, Continuous production agility introduces uh, stability into the um, space industrial base. It allows for a predictable launch tempo, a predictable cadence for manufacturing as well. And with that, um, I think we could withstand these types of global interruptions because we build in a certain amount of resilience. We build in a certain mm -hmm. amount of ability to start and stop production lines. And uh, also we can build in uh, you know, a certain amount of safety in numbers. So if the space industrial base, base needs to stop uh, our launch for any particular time, uh, we can be sure that there's enough assets in space now uh, to manage um, our national security uh, objectives. Um, Great. So thanks, Karen. We actually just got a ton of questions, so there must be a little delay here. Uh, G. Jenkins asked, are there barriers to entry for blockchain? I think the from a, the standpoint of providing blockchain as a blockchain vendor or barriers to entry uh, in terms of being a user. Um, probably, I, I don't know if you want to ask to both, um, he okay. was, or she was not specific in the question. So okay. I don't know if you just want to give a high level yeah. overview. So 
I think there is um, the barrier to entry will be, I think the number one is culture. Uh, people are used to their um, existing business systems. Do you really want to not go to the courthouse when you, uh, let's say, get a, a you know title to your house, for instance? You know, there's mm -hmm. certain things that we've just trusted for millennium, and yeah. to now say that we have this new system which we can't see, it's it's digital. It it's it's um. It's tough for people to really recognize that. And then the other thing is, um, let's take space traffic management, for instance. If the US decides, okay, well, let's make space traffic management something we put on a distributed ledger, does the US give something up in the process and make it more mm -hmm. international than the US wants to be? So there's that as well. There's this competitive aspect of who owns it. And um, I think this open transparency is not often strategic for certain stakeholders. Yeah, thanks, Karen. So our next question, um, we have about three or four more. We'll try to get to them. I know we have a hard stop at two. Uh, for such a concept to work in space traffic management, we need some method of cross-referencing policy with what is on the blockchain. Can you expand on this? Yeah, well, I think this might be one that has to be customized. Um, you know, uh, when we spoke with IBM uh, blockchain um, services, uh, they were talking about how we can borrow things from other supply chains. But yeah. I think I think we're going to see for space traffic management some serious customization. I I I did mention you know we have you know autonomous cars and that mm -hmm. might provide some kind of demo and we might be able to use some of the uh, software and the assets created for that. But there you know let's face it, space is different, and I think we're going to see some very strong tailored projects for space. And I think STM, I'm sorry, space traffic management could be one of those. Thanks, Karen. The next question we have is from Harvey. Do you have an idea as to the opinion or attitude of governments, including the US toward blockchain in space? Well, I've often wondered if government thinks of blockchain as a competitor to what they do. So uh, they, you know, there might be trusted uh, parties in government that don't want to give up their centralized trusted role. Um, however, uh, we are seeing some promise because think of it this way, with launch certification, it's a real paper chase. And it's the kind of work, um, some of the, the paperwork involved and the managing of this is very tedious. Wouldn't it be nice if our um, experts could focus on uh, larger issues and get away from some of the tedium. They can now uh, essentially raise the type of work they do to a higher level. Uh, so while some centralized trusted parties might view DLT and blockchain as a threat to their jobs, they could also view it as an opportunity to um, move certain things that they do now, repetitive things, mm -hmm. off the table and um, you know, raise their body of work. That's great, thank you. Next question we have, what kind of company would pitch blockchain DLT to the military services? We should invite them to our s and events is the uh, question. That's from Lena. Okay, I think we need FFRDCs involved in blockchain because remember uh, the commercial, there's a huge ecosystem of um, different consulting firms focusing on blockchain and they're making terrific progress. It's a booming business, but they have vested commercial interests and they are they do have different implementations and different strengths. So I think having an FFRDC role as an advisor to help the government vet the best uh, implementations and the best designs is, is going to be very important. We have two questions, and I think these will be the last two. So the first one is, uh, Nate said he agrees with you that culture is a constraint. Building trust for change will be key. A modified architecture framework for spaces convergent of domains might help. What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, there was actually an implementation I was reading about last night, and it, it's kind of interesting. Imagine this. Um, you have a satellite up in space. It's like Condosat. Anyone can use it. Well, now mm -hmm. you can use, um, uh, they have 
on the satellite itself, and there's a very small demonstration of this going on right now, the ability to, um, to manage the services of that satellite across a huge number of users that might want to bring down imagery, maybe other mm, types yeah. of data. So uh, I think it's going to move in that direction as we think about the shared economy. We have this larger shared economy. Now we're thinking about sharing mm -hmm. the space resources as well. And blockchain is a way to manage the ledger, manage who's requesting, and manage the entire transaction process to create a more seamless way to uh, have these shared services on one satellite. Great. Okay, our last question for today. Tom asked, companies such as Constellation Networks is starting to work with the government on this. Have we dealt with them before or have you specifically dealt with them? I have not dealt with Constellation Networks. So I'm not too familiar with that one yet. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you everyone for joining us today. We really appreciate you tuning in. Our next episode is going to be on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. We have developing a sustainable spectrum approach for 5G services and critical weather forecasts with David Lubar. Thank you so much and visit aerospace.org slash policy. You can click watch the space policy show. There's a button right on our homepage. Also sign up for alerts so you don't miss out on future events. Thanks again. Thank you.